on World News Tonight. Fighters surrender. Ukrainian troops waved their white flag in Mariupol and now supposedly taken care of by the Russian Defense Ministry. Sanctioning Russia. EU proposes a billion euro investment to reduce dependence on Russian energy. Pollution kills. The UN released a new report that shows grim figures of 9 million deaths in a year due to climate change. And blooming pink. Toronto this year was blessed with Mother Nature's beauty as cherry blossoms reached full bloom. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now, Sweden and Finland finally applied to join NATO, breaking decades of neutrality over the Ukrainian crisis. Russian President Vladimir Putin says that he doesn't see it as a threat, but membership for the two sides could be delayed by opposition from Turkey. Finland and Sweden formally applied to join the NATO alliance on Wednesday, a decision spurred by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Accession is expected to take only a few weeks, but they face objections from Turkey. Neutral throughout the Cold War, Sweden and Finland's decision to join NATO is one of the most significant changes in Europe's security setup for decades. It reflects a sweeping shift of public opinion in the Nordic region since Russia's invasion. During a short ceremony at Allied headquarters, in which the Swedish and Finnish ambassadors to the alliance handed over their application letters, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg welcomed the move. And I warmly welcome the requests by Finland and Sweden to join NATO. You are our closest partners and your membership in NATO would increase our shared security. The applications you have made today are an historic step. Allies will now consider the next steps on their path to NATO. The Nordic countries and their many backers now face uncertain months. All 30 of NATO's members need to approve their membership. Ratification by all allied parliaments could take up to a year, diplomats say. Turkey has surprised its allies in recent days by saying it had reservations about Finnish and Swedish membership. It said the two countries harbour individuals linked to groups it deems terrorists and hit out at arms export embargoes imposed on it after its Syria incursion in 2019. This was Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan speaking in Parliament on Wednesday. We expect our allies to understand our sensitivities, then show respect and ultimately support where possible. Those sensitivities that we have are to protect our borders against attacks by terrorist organizations. For years we have suffered because of this. We have lost a lot. We have paid a heavy price and we are still paying. Stoltenberg said on Wednesday he thought the issues could be resolved. The security interests of all allies have to be taken into account. And we are determined to work through all issues and reach rapid conclusions. Their decision to gather under the NATO umbrella represents a setback for Moscow. With the war in Ukraine triggering the enlargement of the alliance on Russia's borders that its invasion was supposed to prevent. Russia said nearly 700 more Ukrainian fighters had surrendered in Mariupol, although commanders are still hauled up in the tunnels beneath the uh, giant Azovstal steelworks. Russia's defense ministry released footage on Wednesday of what it claims are wounded Ukrainian soldiers from a besieged steel plant in the city of Mariupol. The men appear to be in hospital beds, and a handful spoke briefly to camera. In the video, one says he had received medical treatment, another that they had been given food. It was not possible to establish if the men were speaking freely. Earlier on Wednesday, Moscow said nearly 1,000 Ukrainian fighters had surrendered since Monday. 
The soldiers have been holed up for weeks in the Azovstal steelworks as a last stand against Russian forces determined to take over Mariupol. Top commanders of Ukrainian fighters are still inside the plant, according to the leader of pro-Russian separatists in control of the area. Mariupol is the biggest city Russia has captured so far and allows Russian President Vladimir Putin to claim a rare victory in the war. The city of more than 400,000 people lies in ruins, and Ukraine says tens of thousands died under Russian bombardment. Moscow calls its invasion of Ukraine a special military operation designed to demilitarize its neighbor. The West and Kyiv call that a false pretext for invasion. The US on Wednesday became the latest country to reopen its embassy in Kyiv. Canada, Britain and others have also recently resumed embassy operations. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said that the European Union plans to invest about 300 billion euros by 2030 to end its reliance on Russian oil and gas. The European Union is determined to wean off Russian fossil fuels. To do so, the European Commission has presented a plan, the name Repower EU. For the European Commissioner in charge of energy, it's not going to be an easy task. It is easy to dismiss Europe's ambition to become independent from Russian gas as fishful thinking or even as a recipe for high prices. We recognize that untying Europe from its largest energy supplier is going to be difficult. But the economic benefits of ending our dependency will be much greater than the short-term cost of Repower EU. The proposal has three threads, diversifying imports, saving energy and increasing the use of renewable energy. Solar panels are one of the key elements to reach that goal of increasing the renewable targets to 45% by 2030. All new buildings will have to install solar rooftops. It'll be mandatory for public ones. And from 2029, this will be extended to all new residential buildings. And for big projects like wind offshore farms, bureaucracy will be heavily reduced. To save energy, the European Commission Vice President had a special message for Europeans. Turn down that heating and use less air conditioning. Even small steps, if they're taken by 440 million people, have a huge effect uh, uh, collectively together. And to make sure that Europe can manage to diversify sources, Brussels is working on a joint procurement mechanism that would allow them to buy gas and green hydrogen by pooling demand, what would allow to obtain better prices. It won't be mandatory and countries could decide if they join it or not. For all these projects, investments will be key, with the Commission estimating it'll cost up to 210 billion euros in the next five years. Australians remain split on their election choice just days out from the national poll, with voters highlighting the rising cost of living, climate change and the unpopularity of Prime Minister Scott Morrison as key electoral issues. We have up there in the world news pressure correspondent Timothy Philip, who joins us now from Melbourne in Australia. For more, Timothy. Yes, Shana. With Australia going to the polls on Saturday, polls released showed Morrison's Liberal Nation coalition losing narrowly to centre-left Labour, led by Anthony Albanese, ending nine years of Conservative government. Rising living costs have dominated the final stretches of the campaign, with voters rating it as the most critical issue in some polls. Australian wage growth ticked up by only a fraction last quarter, even as a tightening labour market and record vacancies heightened competition for workers. But consumer price, inflation has risen twice as fast as wages, keeping real income in the red. Adding to cautious instincts on both sides, ahead of the election, leaders are leery of spooking voters with talk of major policy shifts at a time when pandemic, war, inflation, climate change and an increasingly assertive China have left voters keen for reassuring voices. Back to you, Shana. All right, thank you. That was Adi Derana World News Special Correspondent Timothy Philip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. 
The world's oceans grew to their warmest and most acidic levels on record last year. The World Meteorological Organization said as United Nations officials warned that the war in Ukraine threatened global climate commitments. Oceans reached their hottest and most acidic levels on record in 2021, and melting ice sheets pushed sea levels to new heights. That's according to a report from the World Meteorological Organization. It painted a stark picture in its annual global climate report, with Secretary General Petri Talis laying out the numbers. It used to be uh, uh, about two millimeters per year 20 years ago, but recently we have, been, uh, we have seen 4.5 millimeters per year sea level rise, which is a record so far. Atmospheric levels of climate warming carbon dioxide and methane also surpassed previous records, the report added. And with last year's global average temperature 1.11 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial average, the world is inching closer to the 1.5 degree threshold. That's where the effects from warming are expected to become drastic, warns UN Special Advisor Selwyn Hart. Without much, much, much greater action and much greater ambition, much greater urgency, we are about to lose the narrow window of opportunity to keep the 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement alive. UN Chief Antonio Guterres called the report a failure of humanity. The latest UN climate assessment warns humanity must drastically cut greenhouse gas emissions. With energy prices going up and European countries trying to replace Russia as an energy supplier, Guterres said the conflict in Ukraine is only making matters worse. The war in Ukraine and its immediate effects on energy prices is yet another wake-up call. The only sustainable future is a renewable one. Time is running out. The WMO report said the ocean warmed significantly faster in the last 20 years. That trend is not expected to end anytime soon, and the organization warned the impacts of that change could take centuries or even millennia to reverse. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says it's widely expected North Korea will launch a provocation before or even during President Joe Biden's visit to Asia. Saying that the U.S. is fully prepared for such a possibility, he added that the country is in close coordination with countries in the region. The White House warns that there could be a North Korean nuclear test or missile test or both before or even during President Biden's trip to Japan and South Korea. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told reporters Wednesday that Washington is preparing for all contingencies. And uh, we are prepared, obviously, to make both short and longer term adjustments to our military posture as necessary uh, to ensure uh, that we are providing both defense and deterrence to our allies in the region and that we're responding to any North Korean provocation. He explained that the U.S. is coordinating closely with Seoul and Tokyo. Sullivan also added that he spoke with his Chinese counterpart over the phone Wednesday to discuss the matter. According to the White House, the two parties mainly focus on regional security issues and non-proliferation. Regarding the matter, the first deputy chief of the Presidential National Security Office of South Korea, Kim Tae-hyo, told reporters on Wednesday that the possibility of North Korea conducting a nuclear test by this weekend is relatively low, but preparations for an ICBM launch are believed to be imminent. A South Korean expert said the North is preparing for a nuclear test, but this might not be carried out right away. Against his backdrop, Seoul adds that if there is a provocation from the North during Biden's visit, there is a plan B, which would secure the readiness posture of the combined U.S. and South Korea military forces, even if it requires changing the summit schedule. Africa was declared free of wild polio virus just two years ago. Now it's got a new outbreak on its hands. Mozambique reported its first case since 1992, according to the World Health Organization. Mozambique declared a polio outbreak on Wednesday after detecting its first case of the virus in nearly three decades, the World Health Organization has said. That marks the second imported case of wild polio virus in southern Africa this year following an outbreak in Malawi in February. 
polio invades the nervous system and can cause irreversible paralysis within hours. There is no cure for polio, but infection can be prevented through vaccination. The WHO said the latest case was found in a child living in the northeastern Tete region who began experiencing the onset of paralysis towards the end of March. Dr. Matsudiso Moeti, the WHO's regional director for Africa, said in a statement that the detection of another case of wild polio virus in Africa is greatly concerning. She added that it shows how dangerous this virus is and how quickly it can spread. In recent decades, there's been a dramatic reduction in cases worldwide due to intense national and regional immunization campaigns. To halt the spread of the virus, the WHO is supporting vaccination campaigns targeting millions of children in southern Africa. The continent was declared free of indigenous wild polio in 2020 after all wild forms of the virus were eliminated. Genomic sequencing suggests the newly confirmed case is linked to a strain that began circulating in Pakistan in 2019 and is similar to the case in Malawi. Amber Heard's sister testified in the $50 million defamation trial claiming Depp was constantly drunk and violent. Uh, Heard's lawmakers called upon several witnesses to paint Depp as a paranoid abuser who would often launch into a blind rage. Tonight, Amber Heard's contentious time on the stand, followed by fresh bombshells from friends and family. He called her a f used up trash bag, uh, slimy, saggy, uh, just, you know, was thrown out a bunch. Heard's younger sister, Whitney Henriquez, giving graphic testimony, saying Depp was constantly high, drunk, and violent, including one incident where she says he hit her. He comes up behind me strikes me in the back, kind of just somewhere over here. He strikes me in the back. I hear Amber shout, don't hit my sister. She smacks him, lands one. Depp previously denied striking Henriquez. Heard admitted to hitting Depp as a way to defend her sister. Henriquez testifying along with a procession of witnesses called by Heard's lawyers to paint Depp as a paranoid abuser who would often launch into blind rages. He ran into the unit and it scared the shit out of me because he was wasted and screaming. I was worried for her physical safety. I was worried that when he turned, he might accidentally do something that was worse than he ever intended. Heard's former friend Raquel Pennington, who took several pictures of Heard following alleged abuse, getting emotional in pre-recorded testimony while describing injuries she saw on Heard's face and body. Does this picture fairly and accurately depict, um, at least in part, Miss Heard's appearance on that night in December 15, 2015? Yeah. Yes. Also today, Heard's makeup artist testifying she concealed bruises. We covered, you know, the, the discoloration, the bruises with a little slightly heavier concealer. It's the latest chapter in the $50 million defamation suit brought by Johnny Depp after a 2018 op-ed published in the Washington Post where Heard described herself as a public figure representing domestic abuse. Heard countersuing for $100 million. Earlier in the trial, Depp's legal team called witnesses they believed would poke holes in the claims made by Heard. Are you able to testify whether Amber Heard was the victim of domestic violence by Mr. Depp on May 21, 2016. Uh, based on our investigation, it appeared as if she was not. So far, no one has testified they saw Depp hit Heard, but today Heard's attorneys highlighting specific incidents where witnesses testified they had to intervene in fights. Welcome back to World News tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Some European and North American countries are suffering through the highest consumer price index, a main gorge of inflation in decades. Britain's Prince Charles met with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to discuss, amongst different topics, the challenges posed by climate change. Trudeau welcomed Prince Charles during his and the Duchess of Cornwall's three-day Canada tour. A storm with winds of 110 km per hour prompted a snowfall for the second day in southern Brazil. Brazilians and tourists couldn't resist the idea of gathering in the streets to enjoy the natural event. 
Singer Taylor Swift received an honorary doctorate, which is also her first college degree from the New York University. President Biden's trip to Asia will see the launch of a new U.S.-led economic pact known as the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. South Korea is set to formally announce its intention to join during the weekend summit. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with Toronto blooming in pink and white cherry blossoms as people enjoy a nice stroll. Thank you for watching us again. Stay safe and have a good night.